This is a carpenter's square. It's a high-precision craft tool. It's used for marking out components very accurately. And yet, in a recent survey, it was revealed that 38% of British men admitted to having used one as a hammer. Now, the ancient Greeks knew what this was for. Do we honestly accept that a tool used to build the Parthenon should now be used to bang in picture hooks? No. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Man Lab, a mythical place in the mind where chaps drink tea and sort things out. Man Lab is the first step on the long march out of the mire of male mediocrity. It's a place where skills are perfected. Not bad. A controller, but their and incompetence is punished. Take a fail badge. Amongst our many achievements so far, we've learned how to fight a duel. Defeat the Nazis and run a railway network. Tonight, our specialist serving of skills reveal how to apply technology to survive a first date. Chianti, I've heard of Chianti before. It's Chianti, and you don't want that. How to wallpaper, celebrity style. I don't even give you a radio when you're doing this. This is inhuman. We revive the forgotten craft of movie making. <laughs> and I take on mankind's oldest foe, the wasp. <laughs> now, are you embroiled in a petty dispute about the height of your hedge, or possibly planning regulations, or even some tedious aspect of office politics? If you are, keep watching. Last week, in my campaign to reintroduce the art of dueling, I engaged in pistols at dawn with my executive producer to resolve a spat over a parking space. Now more disgruntled men of Britain have come forward, demanding satisfaction or death. This is Max Andrews and Sean Cannon from Kimberley in Nottinghamshire. They have let a petty dispute over the result of a playground fight simmer for over a quarter of a century. I dominated him for 45 minutes, at which point um, he feigned an asthma attack, collapsed to the ground, and, and, and duly the fight was over. Sean, after about 45 minutes, had to go home for, for his tea, I, I seem to remember. Um, he was supposed to come back, and I waited in the rain on that park for a good two hours, and he never bloody came. What took place after that was 25 years of lies and rumours and defamation of character against my good name that Max actually won the fight and that I left and never came back. Time to settle Over this once seat. and for all in an honourable fashion. Next is your sabre. For this duel, Sean and Max have shunned the flintlock pistol for the far more aristocratic sabre. Ha! <laughs> Unlike their dueling forebears, Sean and Max are not actually allowed to kill each other, but they are carrying fake blood bags under their regulation flancy shirts so that the result can never be disputed. And as this is a duel, there are strict rules to abide by. Marking the ground for a sabre duel is really very simple. We place a cross here in the middle of the field of honour, or the disused warehouse of honour, as this one is. And then we put a further two lines here and here, such that, when the combatants stand on them, the tips of their sabres are roughly a foot apart. And then, at the shout of Allez from the presiding officer, which is me, they go for it. That's it. Gentlemen, I must ask you both to acknowledge that the outcome of this contest shall settle for all time all matters arising from accusations of cowardice and counter-cowardice and that they shall hereafter not be mentioned, and there is an end on't. Gentlemen, stand your ground. The 
sabre is an edged weapon, so the duelist may thrust and cut with it. Max slashes Sean's arm, bringing forth the crimson fluid, but he carries on, and tis but a scratch. Did Max really suffer an asthma attack 25 years ago? Did Sean really run home for his tea? It matters not. Now a single blow can settle the matter, once and for all. Uh, you see, scurvy dog. Is he quite dead? Quite dead, sir. Mr. Andrews, honour is satisfied, sir. And now you must leave this place before the constables come. Go, sir, now. Thank you, sir. Seconds, we must leave this tragic arena. Let us go. And so it came to pass that in the year of our Lord, 2010, Mr. Max Andrews of Kimberley proved himself to be, unquestionably, well art. If you've been a victim of impertinence and it wasn't your fault, do please get in touch and our team of experts will try and help you sort it out at dawn. No win, no fee. Write to us at manlab at bbc.co.uk. And please mark your email, I demand satisfaction. Don't put this into Google, whatever you do. Anyway, whatever is happening with our quest to learn the ancient skill of navigation and end the tyranny of Satnav. Now, last week, we were attempting to rescue this illegal immigrant from this beach in Sangat in a silent sailing boat. And unfortunately, we failed because of the weather. So he's still there. Nay! Don't have any programmes left in this series, so we'll just have to have another go in the next series, next year. Crikey. Well, it doesn't matter, because it's the director Tom's birthday, so instead of sailing, perhaps we could build him, I don't know, a giant rocket. And again. And... Action! Tom is depressed. He's been 45 years on this planet, and all he has to show for it is a stupid hat. Thank you. Very good. No, there's nothing wrong with the first one. You only said again because you're being miserable because you're 45. <laughs> what Tom no, needs, look, along with so many other blokes of a certain age, is some new inspiration. <laughs> it's not even funny. So, we're going to build for him the most potent symbol of male endeavour, a rocket though not quite as good as this one. What we have in mind is something tailor-made, something, well, tailored to Tom's mood, in fact. A, a giant multi-stage rocket like Saturn V that separates and dispenses special effects, something that will drag Tom's moribund soul out of the doldrums of middle age to soar and blaze gloriously in the infinite inverted bowl of the night sky. Producing 39 pounds of thrust, the Manlab birthday rocket will power to over 2,000 feet at a velocity of over 200 miles an hour. To make the launch even more spectacular, I've decided to build up to it with a tantalizing musical firework display, choreographed to a song specially chosen for Tom. Time for some scientific testing. What's that one called? Serpent's tail. Serpent's tail? Missile mayhem, what does right. that do? These names promise so much, but if you read the small print, garden fireworks perform only two tricks. They eject stars or emit a shower of sparks. It's always one of those two things, and it, it all tragically reminds me of our family bonfire party when I was a child, when my dad would take each firework out of the box individually, there were only over five or six, tell us what it was called, read out what it would do, stick it in the earth, light it, we'd go, ooh, can I have a hot dog now? We have hundreds of fireworks. They will be set off in giant broadsides and timed to explode perfectly in sync with the music. 
As Charlie the researcher tests them out, I note the length of each fuse, the flight time and the duration of each effect. I like that one. 7.97 second fuse, 29 dead seconds of display. The test firings also get me thinking about the special effects for our giant multi-stage rocket. This is ManLab's heavily sandbagged explosives laboratory. Ooh. This is really what a banger's made from. I start with gunpowder. Next, I add titanium to give sparks. Finally, I move into various compounds, including strontium, red, and copper carbonate. Blue. After much deliberation, I have the formulae for traditional fireworks, stars and sparks. The stars in stage one will be the red and blue mixtures you saw earlier, but now formed into these handy little pellets. Stage two is a bit more esoteric. There is titanium, which will give it a silvery gold colour. It will be more like uh, giant silvery gold fronds, like giant palm leaves in the sky, a golden canopy over our saviour Tom. Because of the rocket's epic ceiling height, we've had to book a launch time slot with air traffic control to avoid downing passing aircraft. But with the window fast approaching, <laughs> I begin to suspect that a key member of our team might not have the right stuff. This is Richie Rocket, the Rocketeer. Hot Dog Richie has spent some hours successfully wrapping the rocket in fatuous birthday paper. This makes us suspicious. No, yeah, it's not straight. Oops, if you can hold that for me. Just... In fact, by the time he's finished fiddling with the Bolshe birthday ballistic, our 7pm deadline is almost upon us. Just don't push on the rocket. <clears throat> Quickly, we set up the fireworks for the preludial display. You need to turn all the fuses the same way so that you'll be able to get at them really. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, with minutes to spare, it was time for Tom's musical birthday display. Tom, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Begin sequence, ignition. Cue music. Ready with row one. Ready with row one. Aerial attack, yes, ignition, ready, ready, go. Missile mayhem coming through now. Ignite Devil's Dawn. Need aerial attack, large, row three. Replenish. Q Serpent's Tail and Bambi. Oh, crap. More missile mayhem. Serpent's Tail. <laughs> big one, big one. Perfect. Ready with rocket ignition, finale. Houston, we have a problem. Rocket! No. no. Rocket! I was disappointed that time. Why, why didn't it work? Do you want to take a torch with you so you can see what's going on? We were nearly as depressed as Tom. But then... eerie metaphor for Tom's life, the rocket soared briefly in a graceful yet futile arc, misfired, and then bit the dust with a final pathetic thud. <laughs> but as NASA themselves discovered, man does not evolve without first making many noble mistakes. And we found consolation in the fact that for a few magical seconds, we had truly reached for the stars. Anyway, now this. Not that, that was a terrible rocket, this. Time for something a little more constructive. We realised the other day that the one thing we don't have in the man lab is a cinema, which is not very difficult to rectify because these days, of course, you can just go to a big department store and leave with something called home cinema. 
and you, you take it home, you plug it in and wire it up, and you get high definition, surround sound, special features coming soon, the lot. The trouble is, though, mm, it's all just a bit passive. You very quickly end up as a sort of pizza-munching sofa sponge absorbing the latest Hollywood blockbuster. So what we decided to do is build our own cinema. But where? Well, I'm going right in there. In the series so far, we've already built a concrete kitchen. Look at that. A working railway network. Not to mention our very own pub. Oh. As a result, the man lab is getting rather full. In fact, the only possible option is to build it where Sim, our inspirational architect, has his workshop. So how many people do you think we could get in here if we move the bench? Well, it would make sense to have the projector behind that piece of glass. Oh, yeah, we need a projector, don't we? I forgot about that. And the projector can be on the outside of the room, so it's nice and quiet, and then have a screen here. So people will come in over there, they will be seen to their seat by someone with a torch, yep. watch the film, Obviously, tiered seating. Tiered seating, curtains. And then in the intermission, they file out and they go to the bar for intermission drinks, which yes. they would have pre-ordered. If we could find an organ for £50 on eBay, maybe you could wheel it in using the Fort lift truck, which we've never used so far, but we do have one. And then during the intermission, I could rise up and play a silly tune whilst you change the reels on the projector. While Sim tackled the practical problems of the build, I went for a pint and a moan about the state of the British film industry with a like-minded soul. Honestly, every few years you get the same story. It says something like, British filmmaking is back on the map. Mm. I know what you mean, and then we get either a film about poor people in North playing in brass band, or it's a load of ludicrous toffs in some massive house in the South and they're all murdering each other. Yeah, well, either that or it's a film on YouTube that you've made about your cat falling down the bog or something. And then more people watch that than went to see where he was there. I know. I can remember when going to the pictures was actually a really big deal. I had to queue up all day once for a ticket to see Jaws. Oh, yeah, that was a proper film. Yeah. Anybody can make a film these days, really. There's no real sort of magic in it anymore. I can remember, actually, when only dead posh people had a camera and it used proper film and it was clockwork. Oh, yeah, you mean like one of these. I'd given myself an idea, literally. That'd be fantastic. OK, let's give it another go. If we're going to build a cinema ourselves, then why not make our own movie, using technology from the heyday of the silver screen? Ben board. I've decided to call my informative yet entertaining film The Plumber Comes. So, without more ado, this is how to make a movie. So I have to be sure that I have the exposure right. I think I'm ready. In three, two, one, action. Ah! Lovely, hold it there. I've set our old clockwork camera here to 25 frames per second because that's what your television at home is showing you. And here they really are frames per second. There is a continuous reel of film running through the camera and a shutter that open and closes 25 times every second, making 25 individual photographs. When you play those back through the projector, the shutter opening and closing will give the impression of a moving image. So we're ready to shoot the next part of this initial scene. The shower has broken. Gemma is distressed. She hasn't finished showering. She needs a plumber to come and mend it for her. Movie making using an old clockwork camera is a time-consuming business. I've run out of film. But if you thought shooting on film was hard work, it's nothing compared with the painstaking care and attention required to edit it. Welcome to the edit suite, which you will recognise as my office. Now, when you edit your happy, slappy mobile phone video at home, you will download it onto a computer and you can move the images around any way you want. But in the olden days, you had this. You can see the individual frames in this little window here. Then you can decide at what point you want to change the scene and you make a cut. Although the editing process is so much simpler these days with computers, some problems remain, such as continuity. If I'm sitting here and then we have a change of scene but we don't have something to go to in between, we haven't shot a cutaway, then you're going to get a continuity error and what's known as a jump cut. 
Now, this is Mark. He's the editor. I'm technically the director in this film, and this is how people would work traditionally. I'd sit here saying, no, I want that, I want that, I want that, and being annoying. And Mark would have to do the difficult bit of trimming the film, splicing it together, watching the frames and all the rest of it. He's wearing gloves so that he doesn't get fingerprints on the film, because they would show up. Time to start cutting. So it starts with a three and a half second establisher of the shower head. Yes. That's the theme of the, the whole film, the shower. That's, there it is there. Yeah. So if I put a mark there at yep. the start of the shot. Now Mark must cut each shot out of the raw footage and hang them up in order. It's tiny. It's time consuming and frankly tedious. Here's a, a situation update. We've been in here for weeks, as far as I can tell. Um, but we're down to the final scene. Those are the clips we need in order, correctly cut to the right length. Now it's just a very simple matter of joining them all together using this stupid little 18th century machine. Um, See you in a week's time. Yeah. God, it's unbelievable. <laughs> This is a radio-controlled toy helicopter. All we've done, really, is arm it with some very sticky flypaper and we've equipped it with a tiny little camera so you can watch the combat action. It's this sort of thing that placed man at the top of the evolutionary pyramid. Right, I think we're ready, Simi. Release the flies. But by the simple marriage of toy chopper and flypaper, we have ethically levelled the fly-man playing field. The radio-controlled helicopter, or the Anarachus Nerdica, is armed with one strip of flypaper. The blue bottle is armed with 1.9 million different types of bacteria, which is why they must be killed. Obviously, this isn't an efficient or particularly effective way of killing flies, but the point is, it is sporting. And it's also much more entertaining than simply flapping at them with a rolled-up newspaper. Oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Oh, I think we might have got one. I can't tell I'm coming in for landing. And I believe... Yes! Look at that. We got one of the blighters, sir. That's one fly down. And as there was a whole squadron of them under that cloche thing, they've actually got off pretty lightly. However, that is not the end of our ongoing war against aerial pestilence. I'm sure you must have noticed that wherever you set up your picnic table, your jam sandwiches and your ginger beer, one of Britain's estimated 850 billion wasps will always find you. There is no point moving to a new location because wherever you go, wasps will always find you. They are the inland revenue of insects. Now, flies, we decided, deserved a sporting chance, but wasps, I'm afraid, are one of the creator's errors, along with Belgium. And this has caused an escalation in the technological arms race, and one that ManLab is very happy to rise to, quite literally, as it turns out. is a T-Rex 600 Nitro Pro helicopter, armed with our own homemade air-to-wasp missile. Actually, it's a small rocket left over from our earlier firework display. Coming round on target. It's connected to an onboard battery. Arming missiles. And fired via radio control from the ground. Missiles away! Whoa, hang on. Wait for it. Missiles away! Well, that was close. Come 
coming in for the attack. Missiles away. Yes! Well, that got rid of some of the wasps. Look, this one's dead. Unfortunately, it's rather defeated the point because it got rid of all of the sandwiches. That's a victory to Man Lab. Thought of. In our quest to resurrect British film, the Man Lab Odeon is taking shape. Sim has sacrificed his workshop area to build a proper cinema, complete with velvet bank seating, screen and projection booth. Meanwhile, sustained by regular deliveries of tea, Mark has completed editing my moving picture, inspired by the great British public information films of the 1970s. All that remains before curtain up is to make the ancient projector work. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Oh, here we go, here we go. Amazingly, the picture is roughly the one I saw in the camera. But... Sound? No sound. Something not on. But there's no time to lose. I've invited notable film critics to the premiere, and they're already propping up the bar. While the audience flocks in, I desperately store for time by distracting them with traditional overpriced cinema popcorn. But it won't hold them for long. I was saving this for the intermission, but the future of British cinema hangs in the balance. <laughs> But then, a thumbs up from Sim. He's mended the projector and saved cinema from the horrors of the 50 pound electronic organ. So now, on with the show. Britons, this woman is about to fall victim to a hazard that can strike anyone at any time. Ah! Hot water failure, it could happen to you. Would you know what to do? Gemma does. Speed dial your local plumber. Pleasant plumber. Well done. When the tradesman arrives, be sure to check his credentials. Hello. Are you a handyman? I'm a very handyman. <laughs> it's not the shower head or the hose. It's the fault with the pressure. Water pressure is not enough to get it all the way up to this level. So I figure the problem is with the pump. Well done, sir. In tall buildings, mains water pressure is not sufficient to reach the upper storeys. Oh, silly me. Ladies, never distract a plumber at work. It damages the national economy. So I've done, there's a five amp fuse here, because there was a five amp fuse originally. This is now going to go back into our multiple plug. Remember, even a blown five amp fuse can ruin your shower. There you go, a fully functioning shower. Happy showering, madam. Remember the plumbing code and use it. Speed dial your plumber, let him in, ask if it's the pump, stop distracting him. It all adds up to happy showering. Splash! Britain's film critics would decide if my message was clear. I think you've got to put it up there with, you know, Citizen Kane. You've got to put it out there with the jaws, some of the classics of the, the genre. I thought it was, for what it did, with the cinematic form, I thought it was incredibly impressive. I don't know anything about plumbing, but I've learned a little bit since watching the film. <clears throat> Author, filmmaker, TV presenter. When will it, you know, you know, when will it end? A couple of weeks ago, I noticed that our researcher, Charlie, was hopelessly in love with his colleague, Cassandra. Charlie! 
To help out, I taught him a skill that any love-struck Romeo should master. I'll fly to thee again and sue for pity to renew my love's distressing. The art of the serenade. If you come to lunch as I've requested Even though Charlie ran away, I could tell she was impressed. But then the folly of youth took over. Charlie thought he could go it alone, without recourse to the sage advice on offer in the man lab. She is beautiful. He took it upon himself to immortalise his beloved in an etching. Some viewers may find the following depiction of an attractive young woman disturbing. Has she seen this? Uh, I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've spent a lot of time talking to Cassandra. I've never noticed that she's got two noses. <laughs> Thanks, James. Thanks. No, sorry, it's not. It's not. It's very touching, <laughs> but it's just not very good. <laughs> Luckily for Charlie, Cassandra's love of the Cubist movement seems to have saved him from rejection. And now. Ta-ra! She's agreed to go out to lunch with him. But, of course, at this point, he now faces a great dilemma, a problem that has afflicted men on first dates down the ages. How do you behave? Well, of course, you can buy no end of books that advise you. Here's one. Manners for men. What women really want. And your mates will give you advice as well. Tons of it. But the problem is, you cannot take a pile of books or a bunch of your mates on a date. Or can you? This is Date Van, the sweaty nerve centre of Operation Romeo. We've wired this romantic Italian restaurant for pictures and sound and equipped Charlie with an earpiece so we can give him advice. So the beauty of this system is that Charlie has at his disposal, going into his ear from us, everything that a nervous man would like to have on a first date but can't take with him for practical reasons. The combined wisdom of two middle-aged men who've spent between them 60 years failing to cop off. Uh, no end of manuals about uh, how to deal with women, how to dress, body language and a number of volumes of English poetry. Uh, so I think we're probably ready. Are you happy? Yeah. Right. Let's see. The first skill to master, the art of small talk. Gentle compliment on the dress, don't overdo it. It's quite a nice dress you are wearing today. Thank you. It's nice to see you outside of the office, but without being smarmy. It was nice to do stuff outside the office, I think. Yeah, really nice. This is brilliant. We say something in here and it comes out in there. I like to pick a wine by a good name. Um, a Merlot Masa Masarac? Yeah. Or Chianti. I've heard of Chianti before. It's Chianti and you don't want that. What about a Valpo Lisiela Classico? Charlie, stop looking nervous and remember it's more important to be a listener than a talker. Do you have any brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. Yep. Got um, two sisters and a sister and a brother. This is better. All right. Where Ranging you... from the ages of 22. How old actually are you? I don't actually know. <laughs> Never ask an age, no! No! I might just pop to the loo. She's going for a wee. Stand up as she leaves the table. Stand up slightly as she leaves. No, too late. He's worrying too much about how he's coming across. She's going to find out what he's really like. So he should just be himself. He's not going to fool anybody. Right. Stand up a bit. <laughs> Perfect. Then you want to be an actress? Or Mm. No, he did a dark drama thing, didn't he? Study yeah, drama or something? Yeah, dabbled. She wanted to be an actress. Hang on. I didn't know that. Did she like poetry? Uh, were you quite into poetry? You, did you like poetry? Um, yeah, I did. Yes, yes right. right. Poetry, click. Excellent. Take one, I'll take one. Right. Okay. I do remember doing something about from Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath topped herself and was a tragic figure. Steer clear. <laughs> she did top herself. Dabbled. Yeah. Dabbled. Did she like John Donne? Did you like John Donne? Um, he said, for example... "'Twas so, but this all pleasure's fancies be." "'Twas so, all pleasure's fancies be," I think, something like that. "'If ever any beauty I did see." Um, "'If any ever beauty I did see." "'Which I desired and got." "'Which I desired and got." "'Twas but a dream of thee." "'Was twat such a dream to be." Listen, you idiot. I'm not very good at remembering it. It comes to me slowly. 
But I can lend you some other stuff. I've got loads of books left over from you. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Definitely. Read over them together. Yeah, if you like. We're going to back off the poetry. We think she's getting a bit defensive. Yeah, can we get the cheesecake, choose. please? Just one. Just one. Thank you. Two forks, Charlie. Two forks, me and Did you call him mate he then? He's very mate. familiar. Charlie, we don't know how you do this, but, but to try subtly to go for the second date, coming in on a food angle, maybe. I do think it'd be fair for you um, to take you out again, but you get to choose the food next time. Yeah, it could do. I mean, we could maybe go like, with everyone from work one night. You'd prefer the two of you? I would think it'd be better just to... I prefer the two of us. I think today's been nice. No, it has been really nice. Um, it's just that... I don't know if my boyfriend would approve, so... It's safer to just go with the, um, the team. Boyfriend. She's got a boyfriend. What the hell? I didn't know you had a boyfriend. Mm. Boyfriend. Why didn't we know she already had a boyfriend? Congratulations. Thanks. Get the bill. Can we get a bill, please, Massimo? God, that's Thank you very much. Love it. So, what have we learned from our bruising encounter with love? One, be attentive, but let her talk. Two, it's Chianti. And three, beware of hidden boyfriends. Not every idea we have on this programme can be brilliant. That one was pretty terrible, to be honest. There you go, mate. Cheers. And anyway, it's all rubbish. All the advice from your mates and your dad, all the stuff in these books, it's absolute cobblers. I think we should put all that stuff behind us and get on with something manly and constructive. Like this, for example. <laughs> And now it's time to watch another well-known media personality struggling with a menial task. Yes, it's Celebrity Man Task. Earlier in the series, the nation held its breath as Alexander Armstrong beat the all-comers record for flat-pack furniture assembly. Last week, we marvelled as TV news veteran John Sargent smashed his personal best for changing a punctured wheel. Today, then, it's time for actor and comedian Hugh Dennis to reveal his secret skill and compete for the Man Lab Badge of Honour. Before Hugh stole my job on that drinking programme, he was an amateur landlord responsible for the interior decor of swathes of the West Midlands. Today, he will try to replicate his historic record set in Warsaw in 1985. Wallpapering a one-bedroom flat for 15 students in 42 minutes and 46 seconds. This exclusive attempt will be overseen by me in the Man Lab Monitoring Centre. This is a pasting table. It's not a very expensive pasting table. Stop moaning. The rules are simple. Any schoolboy error will incur a five-minute time penalty. Now... Barely three minutes on the clock, and Hugh's tentative approach is just not paying the rent. This is the third time he's moved all the tools around. It's quite unpleasant wallpaper. <laughs> I don't even give you a radio when you do this. This is inhuman. Stop moaning. Bad workman and all that. A slow start, but he still knows some tricks of the trade. Good point. He's remembering to take the light switch off. When is he going to realise he hasn't got any glue yet? Mixing the paste should come first. Delay it and the powder won't have time to dissolve properly. I'm counting not mixing the glue at first as a schoolboy area because you're supposed to let it settle a bit. Five minute penalty. He's going to roll it up again. Stop rolling it up. <laughs> glue. After 20 minutes with little progress, Hugh finally starts on the paste. Once at Christmas, I misread the um, bread sauce instructions on the packet bread sauce I was doing, and I had four people over for dinner, and I made bread sauce for 48. <laughs> Stir briskly. But a bit too much stirring, and the fumes seem to be getting to him. 
Yep, it's just rubbish. Why are you lumpy? Here is a man actually talking to wallpaper paste. Oh, After 30 right. minutes of faffing, Hugh finally gets some paper on the wall, but he's forgotten to use his plumb line. Didn't draw a vertical line. Schoolboy error. Five minute penalty. At least he's noticed that the paper is upside down. That's not bad. Next, he downs tools for a cup of tea. But I'm waiting for the foot in the bucket of paste moment. Careful now. <laughs> Refreshed, Hugh rallies himself for one last great hurrah. It's very easy to tear this at the point where it narrows. Oh, yeah, 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 don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. But as the clock runs down, it's all over for the man they once called the Walsall Whirlwind. Ah, oh, bollocks! <laughs> there can be only one verdict. Failed. Well, where that was some pride. They say that for every man, opportunity knocks but once. But in Hugh's case, sadly, it's only the bailiffs. Truly an evening of massive national disappointment brought to you in association with Man Lab. Last week, we invited some lapsed musicians who had achieved no more than grade one on any instrument to an audition with a view to forming a grade one orchestra. Thank you. The experience was like being in a room with the ghosts of Bach and Chopin. It became quite clear why there are eight grades of musical proficiency. I reached grade one standard with some difficulty. I did much better at theory, but it just turned out that I wasn't very talented. The lips have to change. That's one thing that I really hadn't rumbled, is that how important the lips are, because that's what gives you the... Any musicians that were lapsed, that were feeling a bit bad about having let their instrument go, and we're thinking of getting back into it, I would say, get back into it, don't let it go. It's so sad to have a skill and drop it. Fine words and noble. But how would the Grade 1 orchestra cope with their public debut in an intimidating venue? Here, at the Queen of England's own parish church, St Martin in the Fields, Trafalgar Square, London, WC2N, or JJ. Now, this is one of the nation's premier venues for the live performance of classical music. And tonight, 600 discerning music lovers will be coming here to listen to Vivaldi and Bach. But what they don't know is that their concert tonight will be opened rather in the way a preludium precedes the typical Baroque suite by Britain's newest and most ambitious orchestra, the Man Lab Grade Oneers, conducted by Sir Neville Mariner. I was kidding about Sir Neville Mariner, it's conducted by me. Unfortunately, the prospect of playing at such a daunting venue has led to our only trumpeter pulling out with nerves. So, instead of rehearsing with the band, I'm outside on the phone to a very unlikely replacement. Hello, is that Donal? I know things didn't go that well when we, um, when we did the auditions, but we'd quite like you back. <laughs> Donal the trumpeter originally didn't make the band, for rather obvious reasons. In fact, he could only manage the first three notes of Three Blind Mice. But with the brass section in crisis, I had a desperate plan that might just work. Thanks for coming. The three notes that you got right in Three Blind Mice, mm -hmm. which is the first three, those are the three we need. Can you still do them? Well, I can. I, I actually printed this thing off. Well, I wrote it because I was on YouTube and I watched um, a guy do God Save the Queen. So I've done the fingers because I can't remember what I was playing in that audition. I've got well, no idea what he's talking first about. Two, first two fingers are nothing, but I think that nothing is actually all three instead. Can you give it a whirl? Yeah. Because we've got about half an hour. Okay. So let's imagine the orchestra's playing. Okay, so, so I'm sitting down, aren't I? You're sitting down. And I'll be conducting, uh, yeah. and I'll be going. Now <laughs> wait. Oh. So I'm going. <laughs> no, the three Bs. Okay. 
straight are down, across, and up. It's essentially a triangle, a okay. sort of slightly wobbly triangle. So it's D, 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 slight misunderstanding behind us, if that's okay. You are now officially in the grade oneers, but only for the last three notes. Okay, so before that, am I just sitting down? Yeah. Okay. You can do a bit of miming, I suppose. Okay. It's normal on television, but yeah. don't blow anything. So I just remain silent? Yeah. And then just do those last three? You'll still get a credit. Cool. Perfect. Right, thank so you. I'll go do a bit of practice. Huh? Yeah. Now back to my own studies. poem by Thomas Hardy, I think it's called Channel Firing, in which he describes the noise of gunnery practice at sea. And people are starting to wake from the dead, believing it's, you know, it's, it's the resurrection and all that. But God says, ha, no, it will be hotter still when I blow the trumpet. I think he's met his match in Dougal, Donal, whatever his name is. If, if I get that first note, OK then the other two should follow. If the first one's wrong, then the other two will follow as well, but they'll be wrong. To save money, I'd lent the orchestra some of my shirts, into which they changed and sweated profusely with anxious trepidation. I, I get quite nervous if I'm kind of on stage or something, or any, anything, and um, these people have paid you know, a lot of money to come and see this, well, to see a show tonight, and I'm really hoping that they've read the refund policy correctly. But now the time for doubting was over. Ready or not, it was time to unleash the Man Lab Orchestra on an unsuspecting audience. The words of Henry V's speech at Agincourt came to me as I led my happy few, my band of brothers, towards their date with destiny. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that played with us upon St. Martin's Field. Ladies and gentlemen, every musician you have heard performing here has, at some point, taken grade one. The interesting thing about our orchestra here is that its members have only taken grade one. Some of them did this long ago in childhood. Some of them have come to music more recently and taken it as adults. But the thing that unites them is that they have got no further. We wanted to save a few musical lost souls, and this is the result. So here to play for you tonight, the Grade 1 medley. Please welcome the Grade Oneers. <laughs> This glorious performance from my reborn musicians is the final chapter in this campaign to save the humble chap. Our quest has taken us from wild oceans to idyllic gardens. We have experimented and designed, crafted a new homeland for the troubled soul of man, gathering on the way a treasure trove of skills to serve us even unto death. In short, we have emerged blinking into a new dawn of competence. Now it remains only for the prodigal Donal to blow the final fanfare for the common man. A 
As Thomas More wrote, music, oh how faint, how weak, language fades before thy spell. Why should feeling ever speak when thou canst breathe her soul so well? Absolutely elated. I always wanted to play in an orchestra, and I never ever thought I would. And I've started late in life, and it's just brilliant. I thought I'd like come in too early or something, and I was just starting to play, and then I knew, no, it's okay, that's fine. Our work here is done. Um, fantastic. Yeah, I feel great. Really good. I'll be honest, I sort of thought people would be touched by the idea of people who only had grade one having a go, because having a go is, is British and it's decent and it's, you know, it has to be cheered, but I, it, was fun, it was moving. I've never conducted an orchestra in front of people. I've never conducted an orchestra at all. And I became, to be honest, quite choked up. It was, that's fantastic. It's better than being in the World Cup. Loved it. But now we must rest a while from our labors. But fear not, when peril once again threatens the humble chap, then, like King Arthur, Manlab will rise from its slumbers, seize its tools and its book of poems, and save the blokes of Britain. Anyway, that's it from us. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye.